Good morning uh, and welcome to this session on inspiring and educating young people through science and technology. I'm delighted to say we've got four excellent presenters. Uh, I don't think any of them have gold medals at the moment, at least not from the Olympics. Uh, but I'm just as excited as I would be if, uh, if they had been medal winners. Great, uh, great speakers, and I'll ask them to join us, or join me on the stage now. Uh, and while they're doing that, uh, I, want this uh, I want to explain how we're going to run this session a little bit. Uh, we're going to be, I hope, comparatively light on presentation and, and comparatively heavy on interaction. So I want your part in it. I want you to be thinking about questions and I want a discussion and a debate to go on between the panel members and all of you in the room. And to start off in that fashion, I'm going to start with a question to the audience. And the question is uh, going to be, or some questions to you, the audience. The questions are going to be answered through these response systems. Uh, so if you have a look at those response systems now, just things to, to note, uh, as, as nicely displayed on the slide there, uh, the process of answering the uh, questions that are about to follow is first to make sure your response system is on. Uh, so there's an on button there on the bottom right. Uh, then to, uh, there'll be a number of options in giving answers. To select the option that you want to select by cur using the cursor to move up and down. You then press the button three to select the option that you choose. And finally, to send that option off so we know what you've done. Uh, you pass that through. And these questions are uh, really just a little bit to, to gain understanding of your interests and your views. So the f I'd like the first question to go up on the uh, board now. So just thinking about the importance of subjects in education, you can think about it in terms of school age or you can think about it in terms of uh, university or college. I, which are of these subjects do you consider to be the most important? So citizenship, which is about general behavior, if you like, or general relationship within society, science, mathematics, technology, and language. So I'd like you to select and send your options now, and no ducking out. You've just a few seconds to do that. The answer is mathematics, by the way. <laughs> We do have some maths teachers in the, uh, in the, among the speakers. You might see a little bit of a... In fact, maths teachers, maths degree holders, and there we have it. So, Jim, you were right. Uh, any other views there about uh, how the rest of it turns out? Can we keep these results? We will keep these results, and we can share them with you. Okay, that's interesting. Perhaps a little unexpected, but of course it's an unfair question because of uh, clearly there are balances to be had with this. So let's move to our second question. Interesting that uh, citizenship should be so high and science should be so low. Like, what do you think is, which is the least important? Which is not quite the same question. Which is the least important of the subjects? So if you could really? place your votes now, Maybe don't worry, we won't hold you to these <laughs> and we won't publish individually what anybody has said. Are we ready to go? I think we are. Mark the video. Well, there we Can we reconcile that? Uh, citizenship has a... Uh, has a variable uh, sort of record in this. I'm glad it's not anything to do with uh, uh, personal bests or distances and times or anything like that. But it seems that um, language is not so important, which is interesting in a global context. And it seems that citizenship also in that global context is considered by this audience not to be so important. So I. Going to carry on with a couple of others. I hope you'll bear with us. There's just two more, uh, and then you can rest. Well, rest until we have our presentations. Uh, these two are about uh, essentially project-based learning. 
We have a lot of learning which is uh, done by traditional means in, in education, where teachers teach from the front, and uh, there is, uh, I, I guess, it's, a, it's the traditional forms of education we often think of it as. Uh, but then there are, there is an increasing or a growing amount of project-based or challenge-based or inquiry-led learning, which allows students to learn through projects or encourages learning through projects of a particular kind by doing something and having an end result to that. So what, what are your views on project-based learning? How important do you think it is to increase the amount of project-based learning in STEM education? So science, technology, and engi engineering and maths. Oh, I think we've jumped a question there. Oh, we've jumped to the end. Well, I hope you enjoy that. Um, <laughs> oh, no. So that's the question we're seeking an answer to now. How important is it? Not very important, all the way through to critical. So let's be, see what people think. There. So mark the scores. Well, that's interesting to see. It um, fits with my prejudices, so I'm feeling quite good just at the moment. Uh, but uh, there's a, having said that, a significant bump, number of people say not so important, but uh, more towards the important end. And just this final question, uh, that's what we think should be the case, but I wondered what it was like within your jurisdiction, so where you, you work or the areas in which you have responsibility or uh, your knowledge of what goes on in your uh, region or country. I wondered if you could say uh, how well developed project-based learning is in, is in STEM education. Does it occur a lot or not very much at all? Is it well developed or is it pretty much non-existent? So I'd be interested to see what our views of that are. It's exciting really. So let's have a look, Mark, and see what we have on that. So, some, uh, an interesting mix again. Uh, any, any reactions from people in the panel to those results and project-based learning and the amount of it being used in STEM? I think the previous question, which said, I think, if my arithmetic is any good, one in seven or one in eight, people thought that project-based learning wasn't important at all. That was a surprise. Um, you but can see the maths coming out again, by the way. Just trying to interpret the percentages <laughs> for people who are. Uh, but um, this, this slide says it all, doesn't it, that um, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, and uh, Gavin, I don't know how sophisticated your voting system is. I suspect it's probably not quite as developed as it needs to be to do this. But it would be fascinating to see the split in terms of domestic UK responses to that question and responses from our international colleagues, because I suspect the split in responses from different geographies would be quite significant. Uh, and I think that's a, an interesting example of the learning that we as UK uh, representatives here may well need to take from some of our international colleagues here. I think that, that's helpful. Any, anybody else want to? We're done? Excellent. Well, thank you for all of that. That's a, 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 an interesting start, just a, as a reflection. I think that point, Rajay, is, uh, is excellent. I think it would be interesting to see because I, I certainly know that there are countries which favour project-based learning uh, and have it to a greater extent. There are those that uh, are, are less inclined towards it. Um, and certainly there are institutions that work in similar sorts of ways. Uh, and that might be something that we pick up on later on. But so to the presentations. Uh, we have four presenters and now what I'll do, I've asked them to make their presentations crisp and short, and I hope uh, ones which will uh, encourage questions from you. When I'm going to run through all four <laughs> presentations now, uh, or they are going to run through the presentations, and uh, after the presentations, then we'll move to those questions. So be ready with them, and we'll uh, hopefully get a good discussion going for the remainder of the session. Our first speaker is Dr. Michelle Selinger, a one-time maths teacher. I told you it was a theme. Uh, she's worked at Warwick University, the Open University, Cambridge University, 
uh, but then became, as she describes it, an escaped academic. I don't know if that's something to be worried about. Uh, you can judge for yourselves in a moment. Uh, anyway, Michelle is now Director of Education Practice at Cisco, and I welcome her to the podium. Uh, good morning everybody and uh, thank you for coming along today and choosing this session and uh, what I'm going to do is really set the stage in looking at what technology is doing for us in STEM at the moment, what it has the potential to do and some of the things that are about to be realised. But what I want to do is, is to start by looking at the internet. This is a, um, an infographic that comes from Intel and it tells us all, I mean the internet isn't going away, that we have schools in many countries. I work across the world and I visit schools, I visit colleges, I visit universities. And, um, and, and we see people really fighting against it. It's increasingly pervasive, it's something that students use outside school. It's the way that we are going to communicate, it's going to be our phone, it's going to be our television, it's going to be our window on the world, it's going to be the way we access our friends, our colleagues, our peers and our learning. It's giving power to the individuals and it's giving power to communities in unprecedented ways. So we can't avoid its impact, we can't ignore it, its impact on education and its potential impact on education. And we can't ignore the fact that despite the restrictions that we put on schools, that students will learn from it what they will, when they will. And however true or however biased the information they find, they are going to get information from it. And we in schools, in colleges, in universities around the world have to find ways to use this technology in schools to help them to, to make wise and guided decisions about how they use the internet and how they use all the facets of it. But technology alone will not change education. This is a picture of a school, and I think it's one of the best schools in the world I've ever visited. It's a primary school called Silverton Primary School in Victoria, Australia. Now, it's not a rich school. It is one of the lowest socioeconomic areas of the country. And the students, are many of them have English as a second language, yet they achieve far higher in all the standardised tests and every other measure of success than schools around. In fact, the secondary school that they are fed into came to the te head teacher and said, can you slow down, please? And he said, no, can you speed up? These are the students that we are going to see in our schools, in our secondary schools, in our colleges and our universities in the not too distant future. These children have free access to technology. They choose what they want, when they want. They use video cameras, they use MP3 players, MP4 players, iPads, iPods, video cameras, I've said that, data logging, and laptops, desktops. They choose, it's around, it's not locked away in cupboards. They make the choice, they choose it when they need it. They go out into the, the pond that the children designed and built in this really horrible area in the classroom. The head teacher said, well, you decide what to do with it. They've brought a pond, they, put, they have mini beasts, they collect those mini beasts in, they scan them with the digital camera, and they uh, then go onto the internet. They're guided by the teacher, they're guided by their peers. They work in whole class sets, they will work with a group of teachers. They work, they have groups, that, it, it really is the way I see schools of the future, and I see technology totally embedded in there. So what will change education? <clears throat> it's a deep understanding <clears throat> of education, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> of, of education in tomorrow's, oh, I've, got, I've got a bottle down there, but don't worry, I'm fine. Um, it's, it's not just enough to put computers in schools. We have to really understand that we are not preparing students anymore for an industrial age. We've heard this so many times, yet we still are teaching them rubrics and rules and, 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 and models. We're not teaching them that the world today has changed, that it's fundamentally different. And that Michael Barber this morning talked about the nine billion and making us one global society. We compete on a global playing field. We have climate change. We have the rise of the BRIC countries. We have the Arab Spring. We have financial crisis. We have countries going into meltdown. People need new skills and they need to be smarter. 
And in education, we're increasingly recognizing it's not just STEM that's important, but it's STEAM. STEAM is where you add the A for creativity, for the arts, because it's the creativity that we need to bring. And you get economic growth and prosperity from that. So we need to say, what, what does disruptive innovation look like? Because that's what we need, that willingness. And again, Michael talked about the private sector and the, and, and the public sector and the, the, the problems that they each have in, in, in helping to make these changes. Disruptive innovation is what we're talking about. And he put up that grid from Charlie Ledbetter earlier. So we have to stop think, teaching our children for the past. I could talk for hours about what disruptive innovation means, but I only have another few minutes but we, maybe we can discuss that later. But we really have to think about how business, how academics, how schools, how, how colleges, how civil society can work together to really start play a part in preparing our students for the certainty of an uncertain future. So where has t technology had an impact on STEM in particular? Well, I'm going to talk about three things. First, that learning can take place anywhere. So students can get out there. They can take their devices. The, everything is mobile. We have um, 4G now coming along. We have 3G at the moment. We can use webcams. We can use data loggings, video cameras, still cameras. We can gather evidence. We really can make it authentic. They can take place anywhere. And it can take place at home because they have contact with the school. The, the um, virtual classroom in Florida is just one example of many. There's a whole European project looking at virtual classrooms. Classrooms are anywhere. They're no longer bounded by four walls. One teacher with 30 students. We have to start thinking about how we can go out into the field and start to bring the learning into the classroom and use it in exciting ways. Of course, we know that the internet can make dynamic concepts much easier to understand because before all we had were pictures and text. Now we have models, we have simulations, we have video, we have graphics. So it makes time to mastery so much easier and makes those children who found it difficult to grasp before find it easy to grasp now. And you know, they can, learners can start to look at experiments that they could never have done in school because they're too expensive or too dangerous. They can start to see those experiments taking part and taking part in those by adding data to, to some of the models that other people are creating. And finally, data is authentic. So this, you know, we, we see people making use of real-time data. It used to be really boring data that was years out of date in the printed textbook. Now you can go online, you can start to look at, draw inferences by looking at, say, earthquake data on the internet. You can find out where the latest earthquakes were. You can start to make predictions. And you can work with groups of students around the world, all working on that data together and inputting into that, that world. So that's where we're seeing an impact. There are loads of other things, but I've only picked three examples. And then, what is technology about to change? The world is your teacher. I think classroom teachers now are about to just orchestrate the learning environment, not dictate it. They can bring in external experts via video. People like Sally Gundel and Steve Cram today, inspirational. But why do we have to bring in sports people? We can bring in scientists. We can bring in mathematicians. We can bring in people who are excited and animated about their work and really fuel the interest. And then the teachers can then take that and use that input to actually start to do the stuff that you need to know in order to get to where those people are. In um, Cleveland, in Ohio, they are beaming laparoscopic surgery into schools to try and get kids excited about biology. They're doing open heart surgery with a surgeon talking to the students, and answering questions about that surgery. They're learning about the heart. They're seeing the chambers of the heart. That is so motivational. That is so engaging. And it really has had a huge impact on these underachieving students suddenly wanting to be not just technicians. They want to be nurses. They want to be doctors. They want to have real jobs. And it's really changing their whole attitude to school. And we're going to learn more about Bloodhound and, and other projects today. But just to say that the learning environment is out there and we can learn so much from it. The um, pathways that um, students take are, are going to be as important as facts. Now, I used to be a maths teacher, so facts are important. But how many facts do you really need to hold in your head? 
You need to know how to access them. You need to know what pathways to take. You need to know the shortcuts. And again, teachers are there to, to help students make intelligent choices about those pathways. And then the flipped classroom. We keep hearing about um, the Khan Academy. Now, people have mixed reviews about the Khan Academy. Um, I think some of the science stuff is great. I do worry about some of the mathematics, because he's teaching them rules, not understanding. And I think, I do believe it is changing. But the, what it's done is got people to think about it. Consolidation used to be, take place at home. It used to take place where students um, couldn't ask questions. And consolidation is saying, oh, I don't understand that. And I've got nobody to ask. Of course, we now have the internet, and they can find their peers. They can find teachers online. But the consolidation can take place in the classroom. The students watch something up online at home, or in, in after school activity club, anywhere else. And the time in the classroom can really be well spent discussing, consolidating that learning, and looking at you know really developing the inquiry skills that we're looking for. And so goes to my last slide, which is where has the potential of technology yet to be realized. Um, well, new classroom environments. I think we're going to see something happening with university technology colleges, where we're really trying to look at STEM activities in new ways, where 40% of the curriculum, 14 to 16, is going to be on vocational subjects. And they're going to be linked and intertwined with the main core curriculum. And students are going to see relevance, they're going to have mentors, they're going to have opportunities to spend time working on real industry projects, not made up one, real authentic projects that they can work on together. Now that's one example. We're going to see new spaces. We don't need one teacher, 30 children anymore. We need groups of students working together on inquiry, problem-based learning, and we need to see them doing that. And we, we can really help them through all those multimodal means to choose the paths that they learn through best, individualizing learning and really looking at ways in which teachers work in cross-curricular teams and students work in cross and, and work, students work together to solve problems. And then assessment is going to be for learning, not just of learning, and it's going to be multimodal. And again, Michael mentioned that we're going to see people making videos, students working together to make a documentary, which is a very, very powerful way of ordering and representing your thoughts. Um, and we're going to see final assessment, not always based on exams, but continuous assessment, e-portfolios, and so on. And then finally, if we get this all right, we will have autonomous learners. Learners who are motivated, who are engaged, who know what they want to do, who have role models they can turn to, and who can make a difference. Thank you. <laughs>